Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Expat Conversations with me, Michael Nolan. I'd like to thank you very much for tuning in today. As you all know, if you've watched any of these shows before, that we are sponsored by the University of Guadalajara here in Mexico. And Dr. Marco Antonio Cortez Gradado, who is the former general rector or president of the entire University of Guadalajara, is now the director of the Institute of Investigation, Innovation, and Governance. And he has allowed us to have this program, do these different interviews, have these conversations, and help try and get the word out to the expat community. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, once again, I want to say thank you very much for the Monte Carlo Hotel and Resort here in Chapala, Mexico, for allowing us to do the programs here. And it's a beautiful, beautiful facility. If you've never been here, if you're planning a trip to the lakeside area here in the Chapala area, please consider the Monte Carlo. They have unbelievable guest rooms. Uh, they have a great restaurant. They have thermal mineral water baths. And also in each room, they have thermal mineral water showers. This location has been here for over 100 years. It's right on the lake. It's a beautiful place, great property. Uh, they also have a very large regular pool. Uh, they have activity things for conventions, rooms for different kinds of meetings. And uh, like I mentioned, pickleball courts, if I didn't mention those, we have about a dozen pickleball courts. So if you're gonna be coming to the Chapala area or if you want somewhere to, to go for lunch or you're gonna have a family reunion or something, have some guests coming down that uh, won't fit in your house and you don't want Uncle Charlie there anyway, put them over here at the Monte Carlo. I'm sure you'll really, really enjoy it. Today I have a guest that I'm very, very honored to have. I don't know a lot about him, and I'm going to learn probably as much or more than you all are today. Uh, I was at a restaurant the other day with some friends of mine, and we started talking about different restaurants that we haven't been to here in the Lakeside area. And someone said, have you ever been to Viva Mexico restaurant? And I said, no, I've never even heard of it. And they said, well, you need to go there and eat. The food's fabulous. It's a great location, a lot of fun. But the man that owns it and runs it is probably more interesting You'll learn a lot more about him and from him than you will about going to eat at the restaurant. So I am honored today. I did some research and found out who it was and all this. And I'm honored today to have Augustine. I don't even know your last name, Augustine. My I name apologize. is Augustine Vasquez Calvario. Augustine Vasquez, Vasquez Calvario. Calvario. Yeah, that's my full complete name. I'm not saying yeah. that right because I never not do. A problem. But yeah. I can get Augustine done. Yeah, yeah I was saying and, that's enough. Uh, yeah. He is the praetor of the Viva Mexico restaurant. <laughs> and I hear you have great food, and I hear that I need to come over there and have some lunch or dinner. Tell us where your restaurant's at. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your history, and that, that when, when I say where your restaurant's at, tell us the hours, when you're open, what mm -hmm. days. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your history, if you're from the Lakeside area or if you're from wherever. Mm -hmm. And then I want to get into the interesting things that I hear you do. Mm -hmm about the charitable organizations that you do. Uh, when I heard a little bit of your story, it reminded me of a good friend of mine named Jorge Zambrano that lives in Puerto Vallarta. He has a restaurant called Andale's. Uh, he started from nothing. He is actually, after he graduated high school in Guadalajara, his mom and dad sent him off to California mm -hmm. for 10 years and said, we want you to go up there and get educated, learn a profession, learn how to do something. And he started off working in restaurants and this, that, and the other, and he got an education and got all of that going for him. And then he came back to Puerto Vallarta. And people said, why'd you come back? You had it made in LA, you were doing great. And he goes, because my mother and father said, go up there, get educated, learn something, and come back, come back and, and help the society, help yes. the community where yeah. you grew up. Oh. Help the people, the native people of Mexico, and you're Mexican, help them. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And now, Andale's is an incredible, restaurant but it does way more it feeds a lot of people at the homeless shelters and at the dump in Puerto Vallarta where a lot of people live that basically live off of what they mm -hmm. can pillage at the dump but so you remind me a little bit about that because I hear you feed the community mm -hmm. that you do a lot of other things 
and I'm honored to have you on the show today to tell me and the listening audience, all the expats, all the people that tune into this YouTube program, uh, what this guy does, it sounds incredible. And I'm like I said, I'm gonna learn as much mm -hmm. about you and what you do and what you've been doing for a long time as everybody else. So I'll be quiet, which is hard for me to do. Oh, not a problem. We but I'll be quiet and let okay. you just take the okay. stage okay. and the mic and, okay. and and I appreciate your time and thank you and educate us, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I was just gonna pull a little bit, you know. Sure. Yeah. What about the voice? I think we have a good Yeah? Yeah. You okay? Can you hear me now? Okay. Bueno, okay, well, my name is Agustin Vasquez. I'm original from San Juan Cozala. San Juan Cozala, it's around uh, 15, uh, 20 kilometers uh, to the west side, almost at the far end of the lake. And then uh, we belong to another um, municipality. This is Chapala, and then I belong to, or we belong to Jocotepec. That's where my restaurant is. Uh, the restaurant business, I think I started uh, years, years ago because uh, my mother, she used to uh, do uh, cook for events, uh, small weddings or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, 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 that kind of birria or moles, whatever. Yeah, and uh, my, my, uh, my aunt Lupita, that's the word reason we had uh, Viva Mexico, that's the name of the restaurant. We had uh, the Viva, uh, Viva Mexico Tia Lupita because we use the C-A-A-B-R-O-N-E-S like expression, you know, <laughs> but I know that's uh, we we use the Viva Mexico Tia Lupita expression or name because uh, she was the first one who started this business. She started because uh, my my grandfather uh, passed away, and then we like a good family, we grew up together. My mm -hmm. father was in the states, and then we were here. We grew up. Uh, we were, we belong. We had a big family. Ten five brothers and five sisters. Anyway, all, all my family, all uh, generations, uh, I don't know since when, that we were living in this town, maybe 500, who knows? Uh, yeah, but uh, that's, um, we are so proud of it to, to be originals from San Juan Cozala. That's one of the things that makes me have uh, this kind of pride. Uh, and um, I started to learn a little bit about cook because uh, I was doing part of, of the um, restaurant business, like a waiter or like a bartender but uh, one day uh, uh, when I was, when I moved to Ajijic to work in the late the 1980s or uh, one uh, my uh, the the owner of this restaurant she tried to push me to get into the kitchen because she was a really tough lady and then uh, but in a good way that uh, she was she is the one who taught me how to cook you know and then uh, I learned it I learned it from her how to cook and then at that time there were only four or five restaurants in Ajijic and maybe here in Chapala, maybe 10, but now they are, I think there are a couple hundred. Yeah, there must be, I know. Uh, that's what I said when I was with my friends. You know, yeah, they mention things, I said, I've never even heard of that place, I've been here yeah. two and a half years. And yeah, yeah, they are, they are uh, lots of restaurants, business now and then. But uh, one of the good things, you know, because uh, now with the expats and the, and the Mexicans, we just, uh, local Mexicans from Guadalajara, we just only an hour away from Guadalajara. And then we have a good influence every weekend, like uh, the restaurants there near to the lake. Oh, yes. It's wonderful because uh, I know that we, the uh, infrastructure we have here is not good enough because of the streets, I mean, very narrow, or the main road we call the carretera, is not big enough to support maybe 5,000 cars in the weekends. And then uh, that's one of the problems, but uh, uh, we, we are, uh, we are supporting part of the economy of, uh, of the lakeside, North Lakeside area. Sure. Uh, I, I was telling at the beginning of uh, the interview that uh, before in my town, we were going all, all the time to the United States just to work like illegal people. And then we were going uh, every from February to March or April, at least 200 feet people going wow. and working, coming back in, the, in December and then going back. Seasonal so work going up yeah. there. And doing things. Yeah, now with the economy, because uh, thanks to all the expats and the Mexicans, all the people who come to do investment here at the area that are, we're not doing any more that because we can survive here. Yeah. Well, especially in my town, though, because uh, we, don't, we don't have this kind of economy, Chapala has or Jogotepec. My town is so different because uh, that's the mountain and then that's the lake and then it's nothing to do that's uh the rocks well is that where all the yeah. thermal baths are the thermal yes yeah yeah that's uh they they do have the same kind minerals. of uh, minerals yes yeah and uh the it's a potential because uh, we have the this kind of spa mm -hmm. but how many people will work over there 20 50 80 yes that's all but uh, now in my town we are close to 14 15 thousand people living in my town and then it's a big town. Every day is growing and growing like a good Mexican. Well, this whole area, the whole lakeside, the northern lakeside area is yes. growing and growing. Yeah, and growing. it's growing. It's yeah, incredible. but 
if you see, if you have noticed that are, it's a big difference between the north side, lakeside area than the south side. Yes, exactly. You know, yeah, the economy and everything. I know we are paying the price because uh, everything is going up, but we have more opportunity to have something, you know, and also that uh, part of the big problem, I think, is education here in the lakeside area, you know, because uh, it depends on the family you grew up or you got born in because it's not easy for some people that just to go to the university. All the kids or all the guys, uh, they are going uh, to the university. They must have a parents, they are working so hard. And then, well, some of them, they have uh, already that kind of job, but what about the other ones? They are almost, especially to be working in construction, sometimes the, the works they uh, finish, the houses, and then they go mm -hmm. like this. It's not nothing to be on I mean, one level. That's one of the things that, it's not easy to, to send our kids to go in, in to the university. Uh, that was one of the biggest problems we have in education in my town since uh, uh, years ago that uh, some of these kind of priests, he started to push the education in San Juan Cosala and made a, um, a school. And that was the time when everybody went to, to the school. That was uh, 40, 50 years ago, something like that, not, not, not far away. But uh, before that, we just, uh, we were disappearing for the people because people were going from Najijic to Jucatepec and then we, the people know that, that San Juan Cosala was on the like side, mm -hmm. but uh, nobody knows anything about San Juan Cosala. That's one of the reasons we start to, to push that, to, to learn more. And then uh, now we have a lot of students and uh, professional people. I'm so proud about it because some, part of the projects we have uh, in, in San Juan Cosala is to help these kind of the, the kids and send them to the university. Yeah, that's, uh, um, I, I'm part of uh, some of the organizations. Um, they, are not, uh, they are not part of, a, uh, like, a part of the government um, issues or, or branch. No, mm -hmm. that's, uh, the most of them, they are they made it by expats or local people, and then that's the way they, they send it, or they help the kids to go to, to the schools. Kind of scholarship. Yeah, they're like things. scholarships things. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, it's really good because uh, I can see now we have uh, uh, chefs, we have lawyers, we have engineers, we have architects, all kinds of professionals. And not only in my town and everywhere, you can see now these guys, uh, the, the young kids, they are pushing. They, you know, that's, uh, that's a big change we were expecting now. And I can see them even 20 years, boom, everything will change. You know, you mentioned out. earlier that you learned to cook by a woman pushing into the kitchen mm -hmm. and, and this, that, and the other. And that's how <clears throat> most people learn things through life if they don't have a formal education. Yeah. Well, Dr. Cortez, Marco, who I talked about earlier being the general rector of the university, mm -hmm. while he spent some time in Puerto Vallarta, he started the campus there, a culinary school. Yeah. Puerto Vallarta is tourist international. Yeah. It's just like Waikiki in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of hotels, resorts, mm -hmm. restaurants, thousands and thousands of, of people. There's about mm -hmm. 300,000 in the Bay of Banderas area. And that was one thing that was lacking in all these nice restaurants and resorts. Mm -hmm. Really, really professionally trained culinary people. Mm -hmm. So he started, a, he hired one of the best chefs in all of Mexico. Mm -hmm and started a four-year culinary mm -hmm. school at the mm -hmm. majors, like hotel and restaurant administration. And now, instead of the kids starting off like you did, doing a busboy or cleaning tables or washing dishes and then getting pushed in the kitchen, now these guys and girls are going to school and learning exactly how to run restaurants, mm -hmm. how to design kitchens, how to buy the food, how to do organic chemistry so foods don't clash. Mm -hmm. And when they graduate after a four year term, they have their f education in a des degree and they can start at a much, much higher level to support themselves and their families. And hopefully that can continue. I, I know I was talking to Dr. Cortez the other day and he was thinking maybe they could do something similar to the university here in the Lakeside area to where the people can get a more formal education mm -hmm. Because as you know, there's a whole lot more to running a restaurant no. than just cooking something, putting no. it on a plate and serving it. No. You have to be able to rent a building. No. You have to be able to, to buy the supplies. You have to be able to time stuff to where nothing goes spoiled. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to have insurance. You have to do no. all this other stuff, parking. No, let me There's tell so much more to it than uh, just no. cooking and putting it on a plate. Let, like, me, let me tell you something. You know, we started already. It's a total education. Of, yeah, let me tell you something that um, around 15 years ago that I was invited to be part of the project of uh, 
that's a uh, opuse, that's a uh, haltepec, that's uh, they have a place where the the girls, there's only for girls, they, are, they go in a, in a study there, how to run a business, especially in hotels and restaurants. And I'm part of that kind of program and then we teach them, but uh, the only problem is only for girls. Yeah, they are coming from everywhere, from all whole Mexico. Oh, is that and true? I, oh yeah, I and I'm, I'm part of, of the teachers. They're only for women, but I'm only the men can go over there and teach them. And also when they are ready to finish, they come to my restaurant to do the practicals, to practice what they are doing. And then even that are, when they are ready just to leave the school, they say, I was, with the trust they have, and they say, I was, um, do you think I'm gonna be good to run a business? They say, of course, I can teach you. And some, well, the most of them, they, they decide to have a, a coffee place or a restaurant. I go to their place where they live, even in Mexico Central or Michoacan, and I help them to buy all the furniture and tell them, this is the way we do it first, uh, uh, this kind of study, uh, to start to learn uh, if it's the business, it will be good. But I have to be myself to teach them, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, the time they are over there, that's totally different because they are training hotel complete, uh, like the business is a hotel. But uh, when they come to me, that's, I try to find the skill they have and then to send the directions they want to go. And I, I've been doing this since 15 years ago. Well, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, so, something more professional. I didn't yeah. know you did. No, I, I do, community. actually, yeah, That's I famous. do that, yeah. One of the things that are, they have me very tied with this kind of the organization or, or the school. And then the rest of the time that are, I go to some of the universities to do a speech to the new chefs they're coming, mm -hmm. to be aware about what they really want to do. That is not only just to cook a dish is more than that. Oh, it's way, it's, way uh, more. Especially when you are uh, Mexican, we are full of traditions, colors, and, and flavor and taste, you know? To be a Mexican cook is something else. It's well, I've something been very else. fortunate yes. to get to know uh, Luis Del Sorto, uh -huh. who is a the very famous chef from Mexico mm -hmm. City. He was running the Vendanta Resorts, mm -hmm. 24 different restaurants and boutiques, mm -hmm. stores, uh, coffee shops within the Vendanta mm -hmm. facility, yeah. and then the university hired him, Dr. Mm -hmm. Cortez hired him to run the culinary school in Puerto Vallarta. No. And we also had celebrity chefs, uh, Betty Vasquez, oh, okay. who I know yeah. you know, she's yeah. one of the most famous chefs in Mexico <laughs> yeah. and has the Dolphin yeah. in the town of, oh my God, wrote a song about San Blas. San Blas, there she's yeah. unbelievable. She's one yeah. of the three chef mm -hmm. judges on mm -hmm. the best chef program yeah. in Mexico where the people compete yeah. to be the greatest chef of yeah. Mexico, where she's one of the judges. Yeah. And I've had the opportunity to go to the Dolphin and work with her and, and the Food Channel, once or twice a year, we'll bring about eight or ten of the world famous TV chefs mm -hmm. from the United States, from mm -hmm. the Food Channel, and hold a three or four day seminar on how to cook and mm -hmm. how to have classes. Yeah. They have a mixologist from New mm -hmm. York or Los Angeles, someone just yeah. does drinks. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, we can get something going with Dr. Cortez and the University of Guadalajara. Mm -hmm to facilitate you and it'll what you're already doing yeah, and yeah. open it up and make yeah, it it'll even be wonderful, bigger especially for new for the chefs, community. yeah, the community and the new chefs, so yeah. I'm learning a lot from what you're doing, mm -hmm. so thank you very much. I didn't oh, know thank you, yeah, that. thank you. Yeah, that's, that's I, I told you that uh, that's part of the things we are that's doing. That's part of the things you are Yeah, and, then, and also that, well, every time when I want to learn something, a new recipe, I just get my backpack and go and travel to Mexico just walk in different states. I'll tell you what, Mexico has probably some of yeah. the most diverse food. I know, yeah, I and know, it's amazing. And whenever I travel, yeah. I might be in Rome, I might be yeah. in Paris, I might be in China, I might be in Japan. Uh -huh. I always run into a Mexican restaurant. I know. It's, it's incredible yeah. because they love the flavors, they love the diversity of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there's hot, there's cold, there's spicy, spicy. there's <laughs> a little bit of everything in Mexican yeah. food mm -hmm. and it's incredible. Yeah, that's the way I got my recipes. Every time, like, uh, it's coming out, it's the Day of the Dead. I'm and getting then, hungry. I think I'm going to go okay, ahead and eat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to create uh, my new recipes for that event. And every year is a different. And every say, um, they say, what are we going to cook this time? And say, okay, we're going to do this and this. How do you get that idea? I say, I saw in Michoacan. I saw in Guanajuato. I saw in uh, this. And then we're going to do a fusion. And then we're going to make it. Well, you're the one person who probably answered this question. Tell me. I love a dish that I first got in Puerto Vallarta a couple mm -hmm. of times. 
and then I've had it a dozen times here. Chili nogada. Yeah, chili nogada. It was a very, it's a very famous, very tasty, mm -hmm. very colorful dish. Yep. And I've heard several stories how it was kind of yeah. created. Yeah. Do you know the true story and how it was? And would you uh, please give well, what you said? Because it's a very famous dish down Yeah, there. actually, so, that that's that's our uh, specialty of the house in, in, in my restaurant. Is we that have, right? We have all the year around this kind of well, dish. I'm gonna be there tomorrow. M many Later people, today. yeah, many people from everywhere that when they come say, "Do you have chiles and nogada?" Say, "Yeah, of course." And they say, how come you have it? Because in San Juan Cusala, everybody in, in their own yard, they have a pomegranate tree. And that's easy for us to get pomegranate trees. And that's one of the that's ingredients. One of the, that's the main well, ingredient. please tell the story so we can clarify this okay, yeah. for everybody that's watching the well, show. I hope that I'm not going to mix because some of the people, they will have a different thought. But uh, this is the idea we got I me mean, from the people being telling us how they got born in this. They say that uh, when, uh, when we had the independence of Mexico that uh, in the 1810s, that uh, was seen the Iturbi, that was the first emperor, was, uh, you know, that's, uh, and then he invited people from Spain and uh, he went to the nuns and, and tell them that uh, they can cook something special for for these people coming from Spain because they were already that tried to go to have the independence of Spain and they say, yeah. Anyway, they tried with the poblano pepper that was very popular over there. It's and a big, they, large it's green It's a big, pepper. large green pepper, yeah. It, it depends, you know, but some of them, they are really big ones. And, and this guy, they just put a, uh, we call picadillo, that's a ground meat, or they chop, yeah, but that's pork and beef or chicken. Pork and beef, different yeah, what, meats what, what, yes. chopped up together. Now we, we do even vegetarian or with shrimp, whatever, you know, even duck, or, you know, the, it depends on me, the creativity you can have uh, to cook. Anyway, these nuns, they create this and then they just pour in the, uh, the, the picadillo, the meat inside there, and they create, they say that uh, they, um, they wrap it with egg. That's one of the things, and then some people say, no, okay, we're gonna say that uh, they wrap it with egg to keep it, keep it in one form, and then after that, they cover with a, this kind of cream, but uh, um, the, the thing is, uh, they can use that uh, sour cream, but uh, mix it with uh, pecans or whatnot. It depends mm -hmm. what they had over there, and um, they make uh, this kind of flavor, you know, that was different already, and a little bit of cinnamon, all the kind of ingredients they had, and at the end, just to have the three colors of the flag that they were putting there. That's the I'm point sorry. that I hear so yeah. much is the green yeah. of the pepper, yeah. the white of yeah. the cream yes. and the sauce, and then the pomegranate seeds yes. on top it makes it green, white, white and, red, and red, which is the color of the, the, Mexican, color of the flag. Mexican flag. Yeah, we, That's the reason we know and then become like, like uh, the one who represent one, um, is Mexico. the meat cooked separate and then stuffed into the pepper, or yes. is it all cooked at the same no, time? No, no, no. We cook everything separate, and actually and that is the best. Yeah, together. put them all together. There are no less than twenty ingredients over there, and then it's uh. I'll tell you what. It's very, very tasty. Yeah, I know. It's kind of spicy. It's kind of sweet. Yeah, it depends on the and, pepper uh, and the and and crunchy. No, it's not crunchy. Well, the, no. the pomegranate seeds are well, crunchy. Well, yeah, that'll be. And I've even yeah. seen sometimes well, they put even with the pecans. Pecans you know? on yeah, top. Yeah, pecans. Of yeah, pecans. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, a, I'm starving now. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's a speciality of the house, you know. It's very, yeah, very beautiful. It's very, dish. it's beautiful this, you know. Yeah, if it, you just put a decoration. It's almost too pretty, but I, I know. I've I never know. had one yeah. sit there very long because it's yeah. As it's soon as the people arrive to the restaurant, as I say, okay, we have a speciality of the house, and as soon we start to describe, say, stop, just bring me one. That's that's what they do, you know. <laughs> I don't and care about are, whatever else yes. is on the menu. That's what <laughs> yeah. I want. Yeah, and then it's uh, it's very acceptable. But uh, to create this kind of dish in, in our own recipe, it took me forever, at least six months to create our own recipe because I was trying and trying and trying and adding like and then again, and my wife and the cooks, I say, again, again. I'm and gonna, be your, day, I'm yeah. gonna be your next tester. <laughs> when, yeah. Next time you need to come up with something new, uh -huh. and you need somebody to be a taster. You're okay, you're welcome taster, to do that. I'll come okay, over, I might gain 20 pounds. <laughs> Not but, a problem. You know, <laughs> you're welcome, all of eat. you, yeah. No, that's the way we started. Well, thank now, you for telling me yeah, the real story. A anyway, Jack, just let me tell you about my town, you know, and the people. Um, we got benefit uh, from expats uh, groups in uh, in our uh, the way we did the, the, uh, the education. Somebody that a uh, um, couple couple uh, Americans, so they were living in the yeah, and then uh, they started a program to help our community the people with, you know, well, I don't like to say poor people, but are people with the economy, uh, less economy, you know, and then um, they start to see the, the needs of the problem, I mean, of, of the people, the biggest problem, and they start, uh, they belong to a church, uh, this kind of uh, Anglican church in, uh, 
here in, uh, in, in Riveras del Pilar, and uh, they start to help the people in my town. And honestly, I didn't realize that what they were doing because I always was working. But everything happened. I had already the restaurant, and uh, we had the modest light in 2013, I think. Yeah, that was really the bad one. With we the had, big yeah, the big, yes. Yeah, and uh, I had to open the two home shelters with a thousand people. Wow. And then uh, I... I never uh, heard that. Yeah, that was... Um, it was amazing because uh, I didn't... Re everything was dark in the morning and then I didn't even realize uh, the damage we had in our town. And we didn't know that if we have uh, a dead people. And uh, anyway... Um, uh, I took a camera and I have no idea what I took a camera instead of to get a shovel because in that time I was uh, doing uh, real estate business and construction and I had my own restaurant. Anyway, I started to take pictures and then uh, people was telling me, I was, come on, you are a leader and then you should help us. And I sent everybody to my house and get our shovels and leathers and rescue the people. But every time when they were getting people, I was taking pictures. And some of the people, honestly, they didn't like it. And so I was, you should get a shovel. Come on, don't do that. Honestly, but you're documenting history. Yes, but I, I didn't realize that, uh, I mean, something like uh, this one, it's, uh, it's going to help me for my thirst. And then it's, it's part of it. You know, uh, it's, uh, I started to take those ones, but uh, we had all my crew, my people, help the uh, people. And all San Juan Cosala, we, we were scared in those days. Suddenly that uh, around a, almost 8 a.m., we had the last thing uh, came down to the town. And one of the ladies affect her house, and then she was, uh, she we had to rescue from the mud, and then I'm glad she didn't die. And uh, suddenly they told me that what happened, and they brought her in a wheelbarrow carrying, you know, and I, with the lion that had, I started to take a picture, and I saw the tears going down, and but she was full of mud, and I went to the priest because everybody was expecting if we have no dead people. And I say, hey priest, could you, can I use your church? And I say, what for? say because there are a lot of people they need uh, I say okay but I don't tell me I'm an old guy and then I say come on you are the leaders I was saying do whatever you want here the kids and I brought around uh, 500 people 500 and I had no we had no electricity I went home and I got a small generator and I turned around the, the electricity for the church and we start to announce by a speaker and, and uh, we have a microphone and speakers up on the on the uh, church tell the people that if they knew about people getting the, and problems and troubles they just come to, to downtown and they start to bring people and, uh, and also I say we have already 500 people could you help me to feed them and I say sure yeah and then they start to bring food and right at the restaurant we started the first mobile kitchen uh, 15 minutes later they called me and I said Agustin you should come to the plaza because we have another 500 people here I say wow and what year was this? Uh, 2013. 2013. Yeah. And that's 15 years ago. How yeah. many people passed away? No, 2007. 2007. Yeah. yeah. No one. Zero. No one passed away. No. The big mudslide, but it destroyed yes. a lot of property. Oh, and 120 and houses was wow. destroyed. Yeah. Completely destroyed. And some people, they broke uh, legs. And, yeah. And so you started feeding 500 over the church and 500 on the plaza? Uh, we had a 500 on the church and then we had a 500 in another school. The first thing we tell them that are to take a shower and then we call the people to bring towels and new clothes and everything. But we were doing it ourselves because uh, the police could not get into my town. And then that's the way we started to, to survive in this kind of problem. And this thing, it lasts 10 years when feeding these people. And after all the people that uh, they were coming to our town to help us, maybe we could cover 60,000 60, meals. 60,000 yes. meals over the years. In, 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 ten, in 10 days. And you're still, 60,000 meals in 10 days? Yes. I had a lot of people helping me cooking there. Well, now yeah. you, you're, I understand you still continue to do that. Yeah, There's we still not continue. The mudslide, you're not okay, the Okay, this is, this is when the, when That's the when experts, it all began. Yeah, that was the beginning of everything because before I had some kids, when we saw that, uh, I was teaching English because, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of my good friends from the states, he taught me to speak this language, this language, mm -hmm. and also to read and write. And it's say, benefited you a lot in your life. Yes, and after that, everybody was trying to help me to learn and then to be different. Anyway, um, we um, we had this uh, uh, after we uh, everything happened. This kind, this kind, this 
two couple, the American, they were living in my town. They came and gave me the program, the one I want to mention. It. That's, we call them Operation Feed Program. Operation Feed. Operation Feed, yes. Uh, they were feeding the people with needs. And then they say, they told me that if I will, if I would like to help them because they were old already. And I say, come on. And I say, yeah, we'll see, you know, we're getting tired about this. And we need, we are looking for somebody to help us. But I didn't realize that I want to take the control of this, uh, of, of this kind of program. Next day, I said, okay, just show me how it's going to work. They start to explain me how it's going to be. And then people came to help me, to teach me, to taught me how to, I was going to do. And then at the end, they brought me a bunch of files with the record of each family names, mm -hmm. uh, and all the names of the uh, people, I mean, the families, uh, members the age and then the size of the shoes and everything and they were given present even in Christmas okay, and um, uh, that's the beginning of this kind of program. Two or three four families in uh, 2007 when we had the COVID I was feeding 24, 2600 families per month. 2400 families a month? A month, yes. That's incredible. I know. Yeah, we didn't know where the money came from. Are you getting from. any sub subsidies from the government? Or no. It's all no, donations? No, only people like you, like them. Yeah, only donations. And yeah, it's an ongoing program. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I want mm -hmm. the expat community to know and yes. anybody else that's listening to this program. Uh -huh. You can help Operation Feed today by financial assistance. Uh-huh. And I said, uh, volunteering your time, maybe helping in the kitchen yeah, or serving uh, the food well, or driving. Actually, or actually, that's the way we how do. How can they help? Tell everybody yeah, how they can help. Okay, uh, the way we do, uh, it's uh, we buy by uh, twenty-five kilos of uh, rice or beans and and oats, and we just pour in a kilo of a plastic thing, and people comes on Thursday. Uh, 7, 7, 30 a.m. and start to okay, fill so on those Thursdays. Kind of, on Thursdays. Every Thursday? Yes, they, they come Starting in. Starting around 7 o'clock? Yeah, there, there is a... And this is at your restaurant? That's at the restaurant. We restaurant. call on Thursday and then the people come and help us. Okay. Yeah, they, we should contact the... We have a president now. They try to help me. and We have a president. Her name is Janet Kirlin. And uh, it's amazing, the program, because uh, we are not an AC. The AC, that's association uh, from... Uh, the government and then we're not yeah when we were um uh on COVID, it was really one of the sadness part of my life to see people with a you know it was really hard to believe we were we had these kind of problems you know in all the world all the around the world um so and, you basically uh, you take rice and beans rice beans oats uh, soy pasta milk and you bank and you bag it we and bag it and put it in a bag so, and put it in another the families yes in those days uh, we found another guy from uh, mercado de abastos and he's providing the fruit he's given us fruit and, and vegetables it's amazing now we are giving 15 to 20 kilos bags full of things wow. you know yeah it's amazing yeah that's once a week Anyway, not only feeding people, we have all scholarships for kids and and um, and uh, young boys, young boys to go to the university. Uh, we have a school teaching English. We we do whatever I mean, all kind of service for the community. Not only not only in San Juan Cosala. Um, now they are all many expats. They are moving the programs, so they are already in Ajikik and Chapala and helping the students because. Uh, some of the things, you know, one of the times when I was in Canada, that uh, they invited me to talk about uh, Operation V program. And one of the questions they asked me, say, I was saying, what do you think Mexico needs? And I say, only three items, only three things. They say, yeah, that's all. They say, yeah, that's education, education, and education. That's all we need. I say, well, you simple. know, they say you can yeah. give a man a fish and yeah. feed him for one day, mm -hmm. or you can teach a man to fish yes. and feed him for the rest of his life. Yes, yeah. And yeah. that's uh, kind of what, what you're yeah. doing. But as you know, that we are having now big problems with the drugs and alcohol, you know, not only here in, in our area, it's everywhere. And now, especially in Mexico, in Colombia, whatever. But uh, this kind of area that uh, is really hard. And then San Juan Cosala is not going to be the exception. And then we have a big problem. So, huh? Some of the uh, young marriage that the husband disappeared or, mm -hmm. yeah, or the wife. And then they just leave the kids with the grandpa. So they just found somebody else. And then. 
It's really hard, we, but I told you that we are not the only ones. It's everywhere now, these kind of problems, and the drugs, and the alcohol, and then no jobs, or no education, and then it's really hard to find jobs and put together the and so many of the youth end up leaving the area mm -hmm. because there isn't the jobs, mm -hmm. and they don't have the education to go out, and so they are going other places within Mexico, mm -hmm. or trying to get across the United yeah. States so they can do the work. Yeah. When You know, people don't realize this, that Places like California, well, in the United States, I think the minimum wage is like eight or nine dollars. But some areas, especially on the East Coast and West Coast, it might be fifteen, eighteen dollars an hour for minimum wage. If I'm not mistaken, the minimum wage here in Mexico is like eight dollars and fifty cents a day. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're so why right. in the world yeah. would you want to stay here unless you, well, family? That's the most uh, important anchor yeah, here. Family, yeah. But when you can go to a most prosperous, prosperous country in the world and work for double or triple or quadruple, triple, quadruple the money, the money and yeah. send the money back to your family. Mm -hmm. You know, several years ago, I learned when I had my radio show that the number one source of income mm -hmm. in Mexico was Pemex, mm -hmm. oil and gas production and, and exporting. Yeah. Then it was tourism, and then it was actually money being sent back from uh, Mexican people living in the United States mm -hmm. or other countries to the families, to the families here. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the oil price dropped to nothing, mm -hmm. so tourism bumped up, and then mm -hmm. the money being sent back was number two. And then during the pandemic, tourism stopped to nothing. Stopped, yeah. So the number one source of mm -hmm. income for about a year and a half was people that lived in other countries, mainly the United States, sending money back to their yes. families in mm -hmm. the United to, in Mexico yes. to help support mm -hmm. the families and yeah. help them be able to survive. Mm -hmm. Now it's changed a little bit because tourism's up again mm -hmm. and, and Pmex has changed some things Changes where things. they're yes. starting to export a little bit more. And mm -hmm. so, but to think that the number one resource of a country is not exporting stuff or building manufacturing cars and things and mm -hmm. moving it across the border, mm -hmm. but people that have gotten across or sending money back is almost, is very scary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just I'm I'm just amazed at what you've done over the last several years and how you continue to do it and how you help so many people. And yeah, we don't have the landslides anymore. No, we don't I, have the, the just, natural catastrophe, but we have man-made catastrophes such as like saying alcohol, drugs, uh, other problems, social problems, yeah. families breaking up, and this, that, and the other. People moving off, the grandparents are the parents that are getting older passing away. Mm -hmm. And uh, to help the younger generations, I know, exactly. you're doing so much and you're educating. So well, that's the main thing. Just, education, education, education. Just, just last week, uh, some of my friends, they came to visit me at the restaurant and they asked me, they said, Austin, we have a question. What do you think about us? Like, uh, I mean, American or Canadian. So, well, I have nothing against you, but uh, the only thing that if you were not here, I think I'll be in the States. Is, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, because well, we didn't have a choice before. There's a lot know? of really, yeah. really great positive things yeah. that the expat community does yeah. down here, like volunteering, mm -hmm. uh, giving money to charities, helping organize, organizations, mm -hmm. giving their knowledge and education about things they know about that may not be uh, customized down here. But one thing that they do also is negative. They run the price of real estate unbelievably I know. high. That's one of the uh, things we have to And with. when we're used to paying 25, 30 bucks for lunch and 50 bucks for dinner in the States, and we come down here and it's only $12 or $8, oh, yeah, $8 for $8, really $5, nice $5, outside yeah. dinner. <laughs> well, they want to bump it up so they can make a little bit more money so mm -hmm. they can be more successful. But there's positive and negative to everything. The, the biggest negative, th negative I see is the real estate mm -hmm. because they i mean there's lots that sell over here for a hundred hundred fifty thousand dollars for a lot well that's a lifetime savings or a lifetime earnings of a mexican family i know so if we're going to do the negative things we got to do five or six times more positive, more positive things yes to make up the difference so uh, my little sermon to the expats mm -hmm. Come down here and come positive. Come and, and, and help, okay? And uh, educate, train, finance, give scholarships. Do things like that that are positive that's going to help the community. It'll help a lot, yeah. yeah. And a lot of them do. I mean, many, many of them do. Matter of fact, some of the people I understand just are blown away 
that the church organizations and that the expats help as much as they do. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, that now many Mexican people get involved with too because they know that it's really not only the expats, Mexican do, they, they are getting mm -hmm. together, especially in Rotary Clubs. You know, yeah, the Rotary yeah. International yes. does Rotary great, the churches yes. do great, yes. uh, and individuals donate mm -hmm. money. Yes. And we have a lot of snowbirds or people mm -hmm. that just come, the Canadians, the people in the northern United States will come down here from, say, Thanksgiving. November each time till March, more around mm -hmm. Easter, and we call those the snowbirds. Mm -hmm. And but and they help a lot when they're here. But then they go back, and there's a big void. It might be 20, 30 percent of the population go back during the nice seasons in Canada or northern United States. But a lot of programs, a lot of people just send money each month mm -hmm. to people like yourself, mm -hmm. not for your need, but for no, the community, for the community, yeah. for the helping you know it, it's it's tough if you have money coming in six months a year and then all of a sudden it stops like mm -hmm. it did in the pandemic yeah but we have to have more of the expats that go back to continue sending the money you're not here physically to help you can't volunteer but you can send checks or set up an account before you leave and say hey we're going to put you know fifty dollars a hundred dollars two hundred dollars a thousand dollars ten thousand dollars whatever you have into these programs every month so they can continue so when you come back the next year after your snowbird season and when you come back then you're here the, the charities are here the organizations are mm -hmm. here augustine is still here doing yeah. it every single day yeah, yeah. so yeah please continue that's my little mm -hmm. sermon of the expats mm -hmm. they continue it year round not just part of the year augustine we're almost mm -hmm. out of time i don't know where it goes it just flies out the window <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm sure the audience has learned a lot. We've got about five more minutes. Okay. Tell us whatever else you want the expat community to know and everybody else that's listening to this show because uh, when I started this, it was just mainly expats. Mm -hmm. but it was the same with my radio show in Puerto Vallarta. Mm -hmm. When I first started that, it was mainly because it was only in English. But a lot of it, the expats listened to it and they told me when they'd see me on the street and this, that, and the other, hey, you got the perfect face for radio. Well, now I'm on TV or YouTube or whatever, yeah. so now I've got the face for radio and TV. Yeah. But a lot of the people in Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta, the Bay of Bandera, a lot of the Mexicans and other people from around the world started listening to my show too because mm -hmm. they knew I was out <laughs> trying to help the community. Mm -hmm. and that's all I'm trying to do here is get word out how we, the expats, and the Mexican people Mexican that people. have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you can call it stuff. It might be money. It might be vehicles it might be knowledge education yeah. that, that's all stuff to me mm -hmm. and people you know need to help these other communities and there's a lot of mexicans you know everybody thinks oh mexico mexico is a very 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 rich country i know and there are some of the yeah. richest people in the world <laughs> live here in mexico yeah but we have a boxer a named canelo I alvarez who just I lives know. 25 miles away from here that's a multi multi multi-millionaire i know and we have a man named carlos slim that's he's not even one. Mexican, but he's one of the no. richest men in the world, and yes. he helps and lives in this country. Mm -hmm. And him and his family have done so much, but there's thousands of people like mm -hmm. that. So the Mexicans and the expats all help, and so we're begging. We're not begging, we're pleading. We're, we're, what we're doing, we're offering you an opportunity to help. And you'll feel better about yourself knowing that you're helping other people. Yeah, and also, well, we, we're not only the, 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 the only one organization in my town. In Ajijic, in Jocotepec, in Chapala, there are many organizations. You know, if you go to the east side, uh, they're helping people too. That mm -hmm. everywhere that uh, and Rotary International is very Rotary involved. International, in churches. They are, yeah, those those ones too. Yeah, everywhere you go, there you know, there are groups of people try to help us. Soon they need, they saw the need, uh, they just try to do something for the people. Yeah, I, will, I want to tell you that uh, we're not the only ones, but uh, one of the things that uh, this kind of program uh, been running for thirty-five years. And as, as uh, the way I say, it's not an AC. Uh, uh, we just do because we have a maybe we have a good heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do yeah. have a big heart. And, yeah. and one thing that I want everybody to know, we've talked about a lot of the stuff you do, just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Tell people how they can contact you. Is there a website? Is there a Facebook account? Is there a yeah, phone number? Yeah, no, yeah, we, we have. Please a, give that information out. Yeah, no, we have a Facebook uh, page, and then that's, that's uh, uh, Operation Feed Program. You Operation just type Operation Feed. Feed Program, yeah. 
And then all the information, it will come right away on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and then uh, contact the president and or, or the treasurer, and then that will be easy for us. Okay. Uh-huh. Yes. And go by and eat at Viva Mexico? Of course, yeah. Don't forget When do you that. open? You open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, lunch, uh, and dinner? We open from 8.30 till 7, except on Thursdays. We close on Thursdays. Close on Thursdays. Yeah, that's community. because we run the program to feed the families. And yeah. you're located on the main highway? On the, uh, we are we located on the main street. Main that's street going from there. Chapala, Ahihi, on over to Ahoto. Yes, yeah, just where the traffic light, just go down one block and turn to the right one block away. And I'm sure you can ask anybody in that right. town in that area where e everybody knows. is Viva Mexico. Yeah, everybody knows where Viva Mexico is. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, like I said, I apologize. I've never been there, no, but I just learned about problem. it. And I'll be there, I promise. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not going to bring everybody, myself. Yeah. I'm going to bring my for wife's family yeah. okay. and a bunch of other people yeah. and all you Thank expats you if you're hungry. Classes. Not a problem. Here's okay. a place to go with great food Thank and chili you. nogados. What else type of food? No, all kind of food. Yeah, all kind of food. We have cuts and then we have fish uh, in, in, uh, in the Chile and Nevada. And they are all, everything is uh, related to the Mexican food. Sounds it's kind fabulous. of flavor represented. I can't okay. wait to get over there. Okay, my friend. Augustine. Thank you for the invitation. Thank You're you very, very welcome. Much. Thank you for yeah. what you do. Thank oh, you for gracias. all the years that you've dedicated your life mm -hmm. to helping the community. And uh, it's just amazing work. And I'm sure it'll just continue on and on mm -hmm. and on and grow and grow and grow. And, yeah. and you're planting a seed. And one of these days is going to be a great big giant oak tree that we can all sit in the shade of Augustine. No, gracias, amigo. Thank you, sir. Gracias, Muchas Michael. Gracias, Un placer. Gracias. Well, we're wrapping Thank up you. another expat conversation with michael nolan thank you very much for tuning in and again thank you to august and uh everything he does and be sure to go to viva mexico when you're down in this part of the world and have a great dinner or breakfast or mm -hmm. lunch gracias gracias thank you very much happy trails to you until